Welcome back, my friends. Laszlo Montgomery here. Thanks for returning. I'm not knocking it, but we got all the less exciting stuff out of the way already in part one. Things are going to pick up a pace here in part two. We covered Diley's early years and how he went out and made some breaks in his life, lived a life as a thug, pulling down a paycheck from the King of Assassins, Wang Ya Chiao, and later from Big Air's Du Yue Sheng, the Green Gang boss, and from subsequent chance encounters with Hu Zong Nan and a childhood friend from his birthplace in Jiangshan, Mao Ren Feng, it put Dai Li right in the middle of the primordial soup that was going to evolve into the Chiang Kai-shek regime. In this episode, we'll pick up where we left off, from the death of Sun Yat-sen in March 1926, and for the next several years, Chiang Kai-shek had some serious competition that dogged him politically. And it wasn't just coming from the communists, even within the KMT organization and the military. Not everyone was keen on Chiang. But by 1932, he managed to claw his way to the top and got to breathe a momentary sigh of relief. When he took stock of his situation, Chiang saw that some of his success came in part from Dai Li who was there every step of the way when he was fighting for his political life and all throughout Jiang's travails to win the undisputed leadership role in the country, Dai had been his loyal sword and executioner. I wanted to repeat something from last episode. If you want to drill down nice and deep into the whole world of espionage in China from the time of the warlords to the fall of the nationalists in 1949, it truly is a labyrinth of names and heads of organizations, big and small, from the nationalists, communists, Soviets, British, French, American, Japanese. It makes your head spin just trying to keep them all straight. And working hand in glove with all these myriad of spy organizations were thousands and thousands of petty informants on the take, feeding these groups all this raw data data that was analyzed and acted on to strike against each other. Every one of these agencies or secret organizations were involved in the same business. Black ops of all kinds, bribery, assassinations, propaganda, misinformation, blackmail, collecting secret info, and managing spy networks of all shapes and sizes. Total control of China was at stake, so everyone involved in that fight with their eyes on the prize, gave it all they had to try and get a leg up on the competition. I didn't mention them last time, so let me introduce the Blue Shirts and where they stood on this very complicated web of spy networks engaged in all manners of terror and espionage and the things spy agencies do. The Blue Shirts, the Lan Yi She, went by a number of other names, but they're remembered most as the dreaded Blue Shirt Society. A lot of countries had these guys. They're most often described as ultra-nationalists and all that that meant. In this case, in 1930s China, in the KMT context at least, these ultra-nationalists had extreme devotion to both the state and to one man, Chiang Kai-shek. Now, in world history, there were a number of organizations that called themselves the Blue Shirts, but the one from Chinese history... This one was formally established right after the September 18th incident of 1931, Jiu Yiba, when Japan staged an event that they used as a pretext to invade Manchuria. The Blue Shirts were initially based in the capital of Nanjing and were made up of politically reliable types, drawn mostly from the Wampoa Military Academy's political clique, and they swore an oath of loyalty to Chiang Kai-shek. The main mission of the Blue Shirts was to utilize their secretive ways to fight against the Japanese and their collaborators, the communists, and any KMT faction that rivaled theirs. Now, just as it was with the Beiyang clique at the turn of the century that served as as an incubator for future warlords, so it was with the Wampoa clique. It served in a comparable role in the emergence of all these secret societies and organizations that promoted Chiang Kai-shek in all kinds of ways and the destruction of the Chinese communists. The Blue Shirts, 
had a lot of inspiration from European fascist groups as far as how to model themselves. The blue shirts were not created by Jiang, but he found out about them not long after they were founded. After Jiang finally overcame his two main political opponents, Hu Hanmin and Wang Jingwei, in 1932, he used the blue shirts as another tool in his box to supplement the organizations headed by Chen Li Fu and Dai Li to root out any opposition to his rise and to go after any communists. Now, as a paramilitary organization, they placed hunting down communists as their main priority. In total, there were maybe 24,000 blue shirts spread out around China over the eight years of their existence. As their activities gradually expanded far beyond Nanjing, they began thinking a little too independently for Chiang Kai-shek's liking. And in time, he began to see them as a political threat. Now, we'll get to the causes for their demise in just one moment. Dai Li worked in consort with them and was considered part of their group, but he, of course, also ran his own outfit. I read a good quote about the blue shirts that came from the late Professor Lloyd Eastman, who I had the honor to study under at the University of Illinois. He said, quote, The blue shirts may accurately be described as fascist because the methods they employed and ideas expressed coincided with those of recognizably fascist movements because they consciously admired, emulated, and propagandized European fascist ideas, and because many of them thought of themselves as fascist. End quote. We hear the word fascism a lot these days. It's bandied about by anyone trying to dehumanize or attack their opponents, calling them a fascist, but it's, but it's actually defined as a political philosophy, regime, or movement that exalts a nation and often a race and they are all supportive of the idea of a centralized, autocratic government headed by a dictatorial leader who uses severe economic and social regimentation and forcible suppression of opposition. Throughout the 1930s, where the KMT was concerned, you needed some kind of a cheat sheet or cliff notes to keep track of all the secret organizations set up that involved themselves in propaganda, intelligence gathering, political work, and all manners of secret activities, many of which used terror and coercion to eliminate all suspected enemies of the regimes they represented. They were all operating in China, and Dai Li was just one of many. But his organization that he led had infiltrated all these other spy organizations. Dai had the overall big picture view, and he famously didn't like writing things down. And he had one of these incredible encyclopedic memories, and no detail was too small for him to keep stored away for future use. By the mid 1930s, Dai Li's fingerprints were already on a very long list of assassinations and takedowns that he either personally pulled the trigger or signed off on the order for someone else to do the deed. Warlords, Japanese collaborators, communists, of course, journalists, labor organizers, political figures, critics of the regime. Chiang Kai shek's blacklist was a long one. And Dai Li had by now become. Jiang's go-to man for anything of this nature. That Dai was slavishly devoted to Jiang was proven time and again. There's an anecdote that said, so great was his fidelity to Jiang, no one except Dai Li was ever allowed in Jiang's presence carrying a loaded gun. And because of the trust Jiang had in Dai Li, his access to the Generalissimo was right up there with Madame Jiang Kai-shek and her Brother and sisters, he was in a class by himself. On December 12, 1936, Dai Li and the whole KMT intelligence service got caught flat-footed when the young marshal, Zhang Xueliang, along with Yang Hu Cheng, kidnapped Jiang Kai-shek in Xi'an and, some say, changed the course of history. Yeah, we all know the story. Jiang was kidnapped in this so-called Xi'an incident. And the conspirators, in so many words, said to Jiang and his people, stop focusing your efforts on wiping out the communists and get your head in the game as far as what Japan had going on up in Manchuria. The state of Manchukuo 
was set up in 1932 and had now become the empire of Great Manchukuo, with an emperor, empress, and all the trappings. Everyone familiar with this situation knew Japan wasn't going to stop there. Well, this Xi'an incident, it was a dramatic and exciting moment in Chinese history. It starred Chiang Kai-shek, but also Zhou Enlai, and it was Zhou who directed this whole thing from start to finish. Despite the national mood leaning in the direction of Chiang using his military to push back on Japan's encroachments in Manchuria, he had remained laser-focused on annihilating the communists. And at this moment, in 1936, he almost had them. He was this close. And then he got kidnapped, and that was that. Foiled again. Well, these kind of things, making sure your boss doesn't get kidnapped and held for a political ransom, that was Dai Li's job, to suss these things out before they had a chance to happen. You cannot imagine the drama going on behind the scenes in Nanjing and in Xi'an while all this was happening. What does one do in such an unexpected situation? Between the Zhongshan warship incident, the Shanghai massacre, the white terror, the annihilation campaigns against their Jiangxi bases, all the tortured martyrs and the relentless pursuit of communists and their sympathizers. Believe me, Zhou Enlai had plenty of reasons to order a summary execution on Chiang Kai-shek. Zhou himself had once escaped within an inch of his life from Chiang's assassins. And doing all the dirty work for Chiang had been Dai Li's job. Others too, of course, but Dai's handiwork was notorious. Zhou and the communists didn't need a national crisis at this dark hour in Chinese history. Killing Chiang would have done just that. The Marco Polo Bridge incident was now less than a year away. Everything going back to 1895 had been leading up to this moment. Although this gave the communists a huge political advantage, Jiang knew he got outmaneuvered. In the early moments of the kidnapping, one of the options being considered was to bomb Xi'an and try to seize back Jiang by force. But this was fraught with risk, and the idea was dropped. The blue shirts, however without their fearless leader to issue orders, acted independently, and plans were made to send a secret force up to Xi'an and initiate a surprise attack on Jiang's captors. They were all getting set to do this when word was sent to halt this operation and to stand down. In the end, it all came down to Madame Jiang Kai-shek, that is, Song Mei Ling, her brother, T.V. Song, an Australian, William H. Donald, and Dai Li. Donald had been an early mentor of the younger Chang Xue Liang and was brought along as an extra layer of persuasion in the discussions with the young marshal. If Jiang was the most hated man amongst the communists, Dai Li was already a close second. It would have been nothing under these circumstances for Zhou Enlai to have Dai Li abducted and murdered as soon as his plane touched down. Dai Li knew he had little option except to walk into the tiger's den and risk it all. December 21st, 1936, the group flew from Nanjing to Xi'an. And after they landed, and when Dai Li was reunited with Jiang, it said he threw himself at Jiang's feet, sobbing and grabbing him by his legs and begging forgiveness for his dereliction of duty. I'm sure whatever really happened, he was most contrite. And Jiang knew what Dai knew, that he had risked his life in coming here to be of service. Once again, Dai Li showed his boss he was a Jiang Kai-shek man. And though this wouldn't last long because of the ordeal, Dai was also able to bond with Madame Jiang and stood by her side in this traumatic moment for the nationalists and the Jiang regime. He turned on the charm, currying favor, not only with Madame Jiang, but her staff as well. He knew winning her over as a political ally it wasn't crucial, but at least being able to get on her good side would come in handy time and again. The blue shirts, with their reckless idea to storm the location where Jiang was being held and to take him back by force, will be 
unceremoniously shut down on Jiang's orders in March 1937. The Literary Digest once wrote of the blue shirts in 1936 this way, quote, Most likely to upset the teacups were Jiang's own civilian, anti-foreign, bombing, stabbing, shooting, blue shirt terrorists, who once useful, now unmanageable, have become something of a Frankenstein monster, end quote. When it was all over, and Jiang had given his word that he would abandon his campaign to wipe out the communists and join with them to resist Japan, there were fake smiles all around. To give Jiang back some face, Zhang Xueliang surrendered to him and allowed himself to be dealt with however Jiang Kai-shek pleased. Jiang handed him over to Dai Li for safekeeping, and Zhang was held under house arrest for the remainder of Jiang Kai-shek's life. After Jiang passed, almost four decades later, in 1975, only then did the young marshal regain his freedom of movement. He would go on to live for another quarter century, passing away in Hawaii in 2001 at the age of 100. But for as long as Dai Li was alive, it was his job to manage the incarceration of Zhang Xueliang, helping to extricate his boss from the dilemma he found himself in, endeared Dai Li to Jiang even more. Nothing shows greater devotion to someone than to risk your life for them. After the Marco Polo Bridge incident went down, three years to the day Ringo would be born, and after Shanghai had been attacked and Japan occupied the city, it became a very dangerous place to live. It was also difficult to transact business and move money around. To fund his growing spy and police empire, Dai Li and his old boss from his green gang days, Du Yuesheng, they set up a narcotics enterprise that controlled most of the opium sales in China. Plenty of big ear dues gangbangers were in the employ of Dai Li. And throughout the 1930s, they raked in obscene profits peddling drugs. TV Song was in on it too, handling the finances. Du's men did all the cooking, turning the raw materials into morphine and heroin. The whole operation made a mockery of all the official government opium suppression efforts. Money was tight, and drugs always was and always will be a way to make money. The Japanese occupiers, too, they saw what was going on, and they got into the drug business as well, competing head-to-head with Dai Li's operation. And just like you see with the Mexican cartels in our day, there was quite a drug war always brimming below the surface. Cooperation between Du Yuesheng and Dai Li went far beyond the manufacturing and distribution of narcotics. After 1937, the two teamed up in resisting the Japanese and carrying out various acts of sabotage and assassination, tripping up the Japanese at every opportunity. Dai Li had moved his Shanghai operation to Nanjing after the city fell. He wasn't in Nanjing for long and shifted first to Wuhan, and then finally to Chongqing. And not only did Dai Li act in the capacity of Jiang Kai-shek's secret police chief and top spymaster, his agents spread out across China, posing as peasants and non-combatants, supplied Dai with all kinds of critical intel on Japanese troop movements and on-the-scene reports that Dai dutifully brought to Jiang's attention. And the info that Dai Li supplied was more often than not of greater military and strategic value than that supplied by Jiang's own generals. In March 1938, Dai Li's SSD that he headed officially became known as the Bureau of Investigation and Statistics, or Jintong. On paper, at least, the SSD had been nominally under Chen Li Fu and Xu Anzeng's Central Bureau of Investigation and Statistics, known as the Zhongtong. But now, Dai Li's Jintong was directly under the Military Affairs Commission that was headed by Chiang, and it was also referred to as the Military Statistics Bureau, or MSB. No matter Jintong or MSB, the name struck fear in the hearts of anyone who became a person of interest. And in time, it became a word that you whispered 
under your breath, and the rivalry that existed between Chen and Dai Li further intensified. It had been Chiang Kai-shek's idea, especially following the Gu Xunjiang affair, to splinter the intelligence community into competing bureaus. These rivalries created by Chiang did wonders to create inefficiencies and intel gathering. By 1937, there were already five major intel organizations, including the Jintong and Zhongtong. Even the Songs had their own spy network. Who controlled the telephone and telegraphs was one example of intense rivalry. The post office as well. There were more secrets and intelligence to be gleaned from those lines of communication than you could ever possibly imagine. And who got to be the one to manage it all? That was a big source of friction. In the end, Dai Li was the one who led those efforts. During the entirety of the eight-year Chongqing period, it was Dai Li's operatives who monitored everything and acted on the intelligence that was uncovered. For appearance's sake, there were other high-ups who headed up the organization, but the undisputed leader was always Dai Li. In its earliest incarnation, the Jin Tong consisted of four departments and two large offices. In all, there were maybe a hundred people staffing the organization, minuscule compared to how big it would later become. In June 1940, whilst in Hong Kong, Dai Li was spotted by the British police. He didn't like the Brits and they didn't like him. It had been that way for a while. So when he was nabbed and held by the authorities, it fell to Chiang Kai-shek to personally intervene. Dai got released, but his intense dislike of the Brits never wavered, and he took this resentment to his grave. The communists at once had their sights set on infiltrating Dai's MSB. That was the mother load, and believe me, they tried. Zhou Enlai and Kang Sheng put all their efforts into accomplishing this, and they scored some success. The most spectacular of their infiltrations involved Yan Baohang and Chang Luping. Yan Baohang was a high-level KMT official who happened to be very close to Zhang Xueliang. He shared Zhang's belief that the nationalists and communists needed to put their differences aside for the time being to fight their common foe, the Japanese. In September 1937, for a number of reasons that included the unwillingness of Jiang Kai-shek to release Jiang Xueliang from prison, Yan Baohang secretly defected to the communists. Zhou Enlai, however, had Yan stay right where he was, very highly placed in the KMT organization, with regular access to the top leaders, including Jiang and Madam Jiang. Yan Baohang's biggest score, for which he's most known, involved the matter of Hitler's imminent invasion of Russia, Operation Barbarossa. He was positioned high enough in the intelligence community to get wind of this secret. He got word to his colleagues up in Yan'an, and they were able to pass this juicy tidbit to Stalin. So when Hitler's forces invaded Russia on June 22, 1941, Stalin already knew about it. And thanks to Yen Baohang's major intelligence score, the Soviets had been able to prepare. And this ended up being quite a big help. It was the same with Pearl Harbor. The nationalists had been able to uncover information about the surprise attack. Yen, being close to the center of things in the intelligence community, again passed the word to his handlers up in Yan'an, who dutifully passed the info to Stalin, who then decided to let the Yanks in on the secret. The Americans didn't find it credible, but a few days later after the attack on Pearl Harbor, they realized they probably should have done something. Yen Baohang operated right under Dai Li's nose throughout the war years. The damage he caused was incalculable. China hands and experts probably heard of Yen's son, Yen Ming Fu. He's remembered as the head of China's United Front Work Department, as well as one of the political casualties of the Tiananmen June 4th incident or massacre. Right up there with Yen Baohang was Zhang Lu Ping. Her story was even more spectacular. Other than Dai Li's premature death many years later, there was probably no greater calamity that happened to Dai 
than what befell him at the hands of Zhang Luping. Her story is as spectacular as it is little known. She joined the CCP in October 1938, when she was all of 17 years old. After some initial training up in Yan'an, she got sent down to Chongqing, end 1939. And this teenager, she was able to penetrate Dai Li's Jin Tong, and she was privy to everything that went through her office of telecommunications. And she was part of a seven-person communist spy ring that had been able to pass no small amount of secret information to the communists. She and her colleagues operated inside Nationalist China's Signal Intelligence Center. You couldn't dream of a better place to be. This was where all the intel was received and got passed back and forth between MSB stations spread out across China. The Zhang Luping spy ring was probably Dai Li's greatest single humiliation. This gang of seven were handled directly by Ye Jian Ying, who was based in Chongqing during the war at CCP liaison office there. Beginning in 1939, Zhang had been passing working-level operational details of the nationalists to Marshal Ye, who had transmitted everything to Yan'an. It was in February 1942 that Dai Li finally got wind that there was a spy ring within the very nerve center of his MSB empire. Let me say it again. There was probably no one who did more damage to Dai Li than this one young woman. She had access to personnel, org charts, locations of all Jin Tong radio sets installed across China that monitored everything in the airwaves. MSB code books, she got those too. Everything was clandestinely passed along to Ye Jianying. And he was, as you know, pretty high up in the CCP pantheon, so once he got a hold of this info, he knew how to get it into Mao's hands. But Dai Li, as I've indicated, he was not anyone to be taken lightly. He had to be more than just trusted by Jiang. He had to be very good at his job, too. And though Zhang Luping and her spy ring had made a monkey out of him, one day they slipped up and he finally got wind of what had been going on all this time. March 1940, the spy ring was uncovered. All seven, including Zhang Luping, were captured. The extent of their spy work and the damage it caused was slowly figured out. This was an epic blow to Dai Li, who had been fighting this fight going back to his earliest days, exposing communists in Guangzhou at the Wampoa Academy. This spy ring, operating right under his nose, doing the damage they had been doing for two years. Well, Chiang Kai-shek wasn't pleased to find out about this. Well, Chang Lu Ping and the six others, you could probably imagine what was in store for them once they got thrown in a prison cell. They weren't executed at once. We can't know the whole story, though. Propagandists have had a go at it. When they finally killed her, after five years of what was surely living hell, she was only 24 years old. And from this incident, this was where Dai Li had to bow his head in defeat. And in his deepest humility, he believed that just as the communists had the Soviets in their corner, showing them how it was done, giving them all those great gadgets and technologies, that's what Dai Li knew he needed. He was never a fan of Britain, so he turned his eyes in Uncle Sam's direction and looked to them as the obvious choice to ally himself with. And next episode, we will hear the exciting conclusion to the story of China's Himmler, General Dai Li, and we'll see how the Americans, in all their gung-ho spirit and staggering naivete, will put the entirety of their unrivaled arsenal of spying resources at Dai Li's disposal. And this is the story of the Friendship Project, which quickly became the Sino-American Cooperative Organization, better known as SACO, for sure. You are not going to want to miss this exciting conclusion. Okay, Dai Li, part three next week. Seiko, Milton, Mary Miles, Wild Bill Donovan, Vinegar Joe, maybe. What a lineup. I do hope you'll return. 
And until then, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from the site of the 1994 World Cup, Los Angeles, California. Do yourself a favor and come back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.